All right, thank you, Rich. It is a real pleasure to be here to um, kick off the conference, be a leadoff batter. My plan is to lay down a bunt down the third baseline in, line, in honor of the playoffs. Go Astros. And, uh, um, and uh, then I'm going to hand it off to the, to the cleanup hitters down the road. Uh, one of my bosses, Mark Yarborough, who certainly will move me around the bases. And then Joel Rosenberg's going to bring me home. So, uh, so anyway, um, and my full title is, is The Biblical Roots for the Hope of Peace Between Arab and Jews, Kingdom and Reconciliation. And I'm just going to dive in. This is going to be very old school. I'm reading to you a paper someone wrote me yesterday. Are you going to have a PowerPoint or anything like that? I said, no, I'm very old school. I left my chisel and hammer at home. So uh, even the quill is a technological advance. So here we go. The business of salvation is about more than individuals. It is also about groups and bringing them together, including formerly, or maybe presently, hostile groups. At its root is a plan to restore creation and bring it back to its intended goal. Life on earth is designed to be a place where people could flourish in their relationship to God and with each other. Some people may ask what that has to do with the Middle East and Israel today. The short answer is a great deal. God's plan for the kingdom is designed to restore humanity to its rightful place. People who image God are called to manage well the garden of the world God has created. Our rebellion and detachment from God not only has resulted in a world full of chaos, it has produced the kind of tribalism that feeds war and devastation. This essay considers the structure of the kingdom and focuses on a goal the kingdom program, the kingdom program has to bring people together in a reconciled relationship with God and each other. In that space is the hope of all kinds of restoration, including that in the tangled world that is the Middle East. The idea that the kingdom program of God in Jesus is already not yet is not a recent creation, as some have charged. This already not yet feature of the kingdom is an important preamble to considering the topic of reconciliation and the role of the church in reflecting that call. It is a program that runs parallel to how salvation itself works, where we are saved, but we also expect more to come in our salvation in the future. It is deeply rooted in biblical teaching and perspective, and it points to a program that is deeply ethical and vision casting for how the church is to live out her calling. So I want to fir first look at key texts in Luke-Acts, although actually for this presentation I'm going to skip that section for the sake of time that make a distinction, that make the already not yet distinction, which is important to the, to the overall view of what's going on biblically. And I'm going to focus on a hope for reconciliation that involves both Jews and the nations, including the Arab world. It is a textual reading showing the stewardship of God's management of salvation. And I tell my students that one of the words that I didn't think very much about when I was going through seminary that has become an important theological word for me is the word stewardship. We were created in Genesis 1 to manage the earth well, to multiply, fill the earth, and exercise dominion over the creation. That's talking about stewardship and management. So that's become a big word for me theologically. It reveals a program coming in distinct stages. Such stewardship is what a dispensation is all about, as it shows both the intent of God's program, provides a hermeneal key for seeing the program of God, and lays the groundwork for appreciating the core relational and ethical call of Scripture. That call, focused on reconciliation between God, individuals, and corporate groups, has application even to the most complex of human relationships, including the Middle East. So what does God's kingdom program look like, and what promises lie within it? Now, I'm skipping a section in the essay. These are essays, by the way. What you're hearing are essays that are, that are part of a book that's going to be on, on the gospel in the Middle East. That's going to be true of all the presentations I think you hear today. And I'm skipping a section that talks about Luke's two-part structure, structure of the kingdom program as already not yet. And I'm just going to deliver, talk about the results of that. So I'm going to jump to discussing the current arrival of salvific benefits as part of the already. The descent of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, made possible by Jesus' resurrection and ascension, marks the arrival of the already period of promise in terms of salvific benefits to its recipients. 
Jesus now functions as Lord Messiah, distributing blessings promised in the Hebrew Scriptures and holding all people accountable for responding to him. Acts 11.15 referred back to the event of the day of Pentecost as the beginning. Here the hope of the new covenant was inaugurated and made possible by Jesus' death. These current blessings are part of the eschaton because in Luke's view they represent the initial line of Old Testament promises that God fulfilled. In the Holy Spirit, God is at work in his people. Jesus rules with sovereignty over these benefits as the mediator of divine blessing. This is the point Peter makes in his speech in Acts 2, that Israel can know God has made Jesus both Lord and Messiah, Acts 2.36, because the Spirit has come to God's believing people. The verse says, Let all the house of Israel know with assurance that both Lord and Christ God has made him. I even put it in order so that the Lord and Christ part is thrown forward as it is in the Greek. This Jesus whom you crucified. The kingdom has come because the power of God is expressed through Jesus by means of the Holy Spirit working in his people. But there also are not yet texts, things that are yet to come that are part of the kingdom program. And that involves the hope of restoration and Israel's role in that restoration. So there is a, a not yet element in Luke's eschatology. Here Luke presents the hope of consummation in which God's promises will be brought to full realization. All the prophetic promises made to Israel will be fulfilled. And the key text here is Acts 3, 19 to 21, which is a portion of a larger speech which Peter gave right after Pentecost. As God will restore everything, and the text reads, Repent, therefore, and turn for the washing of your sins, so that the times of refreshing might come from before the Lord, and he might send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom it is necessary that heaven receive, until the time of the restoration of all things, and here's the important phrase, which God spoke about through the mouth of his holy prophets of old. In other words, if you want to know what's involved in that restoration, what it looks like, what its description is, and what's coming, all you have to do is to pick up, to echo the words of Mitch Glaser this morning, the fat part of your Bible, okay, the Hebrew Scriptures, and read those texts, and you will see what is coming. Note how the prophets speak with a singular voice. It's uh, the mouth of the holy prophet. So I've got multiple prophets, but i got one mouth speaking. God speaks through them about his program. Also important is that what is left to be done is already described in the prophets. To see what God will do, one need only go back and read those texts. There is no hint here of a reconfiguration of anything as a result of Jesus' coming. That sentence is dedicated to the supersessionists who might be listening. He realizes what was always promised and revealed. God will keep his promises. And what was said is still the case. In Acts 3.20, the times of refreshing is a New, is a New Testament hapax expression. Now, for those of you who don't live in the world of Greek, hapax means something that's said only once. It's a, it's a one-time expression. It looks to a period of time that includes rest and refreshment. The term anaphyxis refers to a cooling to relieve trouble or to dry out a, a wound, and it's often simply translated refreshment. In the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures, the only use of anaphyxis is in Exodus 8.11, which equals 8.15 in English, where it refers to relief from the plague of the frogs. The verb anasiko, to refresh, is used of Sabbath rest of slaves and animals and even the soothing of Saul by David's music. The arrival, then, is a period of messianic refreshment, the definitive age of salvation. The idea has parallels in Judaism, and I allude to texts in 2nd Ezra, 2nd Baruch, and 1st Enoch, books I'm sure you've had your devotions in recently, <laughs> and is traditional in its origin. It refers to entry into a new and unending eschatological life before the Lord. The closest parallel in the New Testament is the concept of rest in Hebrews 3 and 4. One wonders if Anasuchus alludes to the Spirit's washing work in the Messianic age that points to the start of spiritual refreshment, but I'll leave you to think about that in your spare time. 
The reference to times and seasons contains terms that appear in Luke 21, 24, with reference to the times of the Gentiles, or the current era, and Acts 1, 6, and 7. The question in Acts 1 receives a reply that it is not for Peter's hearers to know the dates and times. That's in response to a question the disciples raised to Jesus in Acts 1. Is this the time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus very politely said, that's the Father's business, not yours. A reply that uses both terms for time, kairoi and krinoi. In other words, their repentance opens up the possibility of both times of refreshment and times establishing all the things God promised. There is nothing about the question in Acts 1 about whether this is the time the kingdom will be restored to Israel that suggests the question is wrong or reflects a poor premise. Jesus simply says this is, this is in the Father's timing. Jesus had just spent 40 days with the disciples and explained the hope of Scripture to them. And they still have this hope after those discussions. Apparently, they are right to have it, but the timing of exactly when this is going to happen is not theirs to know. All of this takes place before the Lord and before his presence. Peter's exposition in Acts 3 is a reflection of what they learned from the Acts 1 exchange with Jesus. This entry into refreshment is the completion of God's plan with Christ's return. Peter urges repentance so that one can participate in God's entire planned program from start to finish. A key aspect of that program is Jesus' return when Christ will execute judgment on behalf of righteousness and complete God's promise already outlined in the prophetic teaching of the Hebrew Scriptures. Nothing Peter says indicates that anything promised there has been changed, including what is said about Israel. There may be additions and expansions of those ideas in light of revelation of the period tied to Jesus, but in the rest of what Jesus brings, he will complete what already has also been revealed. The timing of consummation comes down the road, but what will happen there has been described in those Hebrew Scripture texts. Peter speaks of God sending his Christ, the Christ appointed, for all of them, and his audience is primarily Jewish. The two other occurrences of this verb in Acts are about Paul as a chosen servant of God. That's dealing with the term appointed. This Christ is received in heaven for now. Here's another way to portray the experience of the ascension. One of the more important doctrines in the New Testament that's very underdeveloped in our thinking, I think, is what happens not as a result of Jesus being raised and made alive, but what the significance of the ascension is, the fact that he sits at the right hand of God. Heaven holds Jesus at God's side until the day he is revealed to the world in power at his return. Jesus is not passive until that return, however, for Acts 2 shows that Jesus is active now in salvation by distributing the Spirit. He is the mediator of the distribution of the Spirit to the people of God who respond to the gospel message. And Acts 3 shows him as the source of healing for a crippled man that is a picture of what all that salvation represents. This is executive, messianic, kingdom authority that Jesus is exercising from heaven now as he blesses those who come to him with forgiveness and the Spirit. As Bruce notes, quote, Jesus must reign at God's right hand until all hostile powers are overthrown, 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 28. Nevertheless, with his return comes, quote, the seasons of the restoration of all things. That's a very literal translation of Acts 3, 21. The end is reestablishing the original creation's pristine character. This restoration is what, uh, what Jesus will bring with his return, an idea given later development in Revelation 19 to 22, but whose roots, Peter declares, are already evident in that which God promised long ago through his holy prophets. The relative pronoun, hon, could refer back to the seasons of which God spoke, or to all things of which God spoke, but in either case, it doesn't make any difference for the point that I'm making. Acts 3.24 appears to highlight the period of time being addressed by the promise, these days, but it's the content that is being highlighted here, all things will be restored. The new world and the messianic creation appear in a final and complete restoration. 
In the New Testament, this idea is discussed in Matthew 20, 19, 28, Romans 8, 18 to 23, and Hebrews 2, 5 to 8. The point is that God has already indicated what the end will be like. So to learn about the future, Peter urges the people to note what God has already said through the prophets about the new era that the eschaton will bring. The expression about the prophets is like Luke 1, 70, the idea that Jesus is coming as the messianic birth of John the Baptist and Jesus are announced is something that's part of the plan and program of God. Texts such as Isaiah 65, 66 are in view, where Israel is restored to fullness. Also Isaiah 34, 4, 51, 6, Jeremiah 15, 18 and 19, 16, 15, 23, 8, 24, 6, Ezekiel 17, 23, Amos 9 to 11, hike. Isaiah 2, 1 to 4 and 19, 23 to 25 look to Israel and Jerusalem as the center of this activity. And Isaiah 19 speaks of a highway running from Egypt through Jerusalem to Assyria, right in the heart of the area that we're talking about in the Middle East. A physical kingdom on earth will span the globe. The two expressions for time, Cairo and Koinoi, probably look at one period as opposed to distinct periods of time. However, it is seen as one great extended period, their terms are plural, whose high point is Christ's return. And so the stress is on what participation in the period of the Messianic blessing ultimately will yield. In sum, three blessings are offered in Acts 9, 3, 19 to 21 the forgiveness of sins, the promise of times of refreshing that includes the prophet's hope for the nations, and the opportunity to participate in the return of the Messiah. Jesus brings all of this over time, and the core story is told in the writings from the prophets of old. The result? Reconciliation to come with Jew and Gentile. So what is foreseen by these texts Peter refers to in Acts 3? The time will come, the time to come will be a period of reconciliation for the world, Jews and Gentiles, including Arabs. They will be brought together. Here are a few texts from the Hebrew scriptures that show what Acts 3 was alluding to by referring to the restoration to come in the mouth of the holy prophets of old. First, Isaiah 2, 1 to 4, nations gathered with Israel. The prophet Isaiah is in the midst of challenging a stubborn people caught in disobedience. He offers this word of hope in Isaiah 2, 1 to 4. The entire section is called a word from the Lord. This marks it out as an important passage. The Hazah points to an utterance given with divine insight. It is a special disclosure from God. Isaiah gives a message about Judah and Jerusalem. He announces that the mountain of the Lord's temple will endure into the latter days. This time period for Isaiah is simply the last days of human history. He has no more detailed event, calendar of events than this. This is when full deliverance finally comes in all its fullness. And in that time, he declares, nations will stream to Jerusalem. They will worship on the Lord's high mountain and come to learn the Lord's standards. Zion will be the center for instruction. Literally, the Torah will go out from there. Torah in this context is about God's will and ways as the previous parallelism shows. Cases will be settled among nations here. Think of the Supreme Court located in Jerusalem. Swords will be beaten into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. All that money for the defense budget is gone. There will no longer be, uh, there will no longer train for war. The picture is of a world at peace before the one God. All the nations side by side gathered before one God. This reconciliation to peace involves all the nations and Israel at its center. Judah and Jerusalem in the midst of the nations will have this role, and in the context of the book, such hope should, come to, should lead to faithfulness within Israel now. This is an important text. While other Old Testament texts speak of the judgment of the nations as righteousness comes, this text pictures the aftermath and the result of what God will bring, a reconciliation that includes righteousness, instruction, and peace. It is not a melding in of people, but a gathering of nations who no longer battle as they had. It's interesting. The distinctions of who people are remains, but the oneness is also displayed at the same time. Also significant is that this note of hope comes at the beginning of the prophetic book. It is a note of introduction that is to abide in one's thinking as one moves through Isaiah and all the many ideas that 
the prophet raises. Another point note from this text is important. This redemption comes to this earth and this history. This is not a dualistic vision of something, something happening above or something happening in a newly created physical reality emerging out of what it had been. It is an account of God's resolution of conflict in the current stream of history and reality. Other Old Testament texts travel the same road, speaking to the same reality, and these are primarily texts in Isaiah as well. You could look up 14, 1 to 2, 45, 22 and 23, 49, 26, 56, 7, 61 to 14, and 66, 18 to 21, along with other texts that I'm about to mention. As Watts puts it, Jerusalem has an abiding place in God's future. Isaiah 19, 23 to 25, and blessing with the world. The picture of Isaiah 2 is reinforced by images in Isaiah 19. The reference opens with a discussion of that day, the period when God is delivering and Egypt is pulled into the fold as he both strikes and heals them. These two vectors are part of Old Testament hope. Israel will be victorious, but it will not be a victory that leads to vanquishing, but to reconciliation. Here we have a highway running from Egypt to Assyria. People will travel back and forth, interacting openly in all kinds of ways. Those nations will worship together. Assyria and Egypt, former enemies, will bow alongside of Israel to God. That Assyria, an even more threatening neighbor than Egypt is included in this vision, is even more surprising. Israel is in the middle position between them. She will be a third member of the group and will be a recipient of blessing in the midst of the earth. This is still about events in, on earth in the midst of current history. There is no above and below dualism here. Is, Egypt will be blessed as my people. Assyria will be affirmed as the work of God's hands. And God's inheritance, Israel, will also be blessed in the land and on the earth. Nothing in this language foresees the absorption or disappearance of Israel as a people and nation. In fact, the identification of Israel as an inheritance pictures them as a people possessed by God and as beneficiaries of that special relationship that he has with them. The picture is of a reconciliation between peoples whose identity remains even in the midst of their gathering together as one. The two nations most hostile to Israel up to the time of Isaiah are now seen as allies and cohorts. Isaiah 55 and 56, the nation with the nations. This is all tied into a covenantal blessing in Isaiah 55 and 56. Here the promises of David are portrayed as sustaining water that rescues the thirsty as they are handed over to the people. And as an aside, if you think about John 4 and what that represents and the water that he promises uh, to the Samaritan woman, uh, particularized in the Spirit of God but pointing to covenantal blessing, you're in the same background and you're drinking from the same water well. Here are the promises of David are portrayed as sustaining water that rescues the thirsty as they are handed over to the people. God will cut a covenant of duration with the people just like the firm covenant he made with David. So in Isaiah 55, what we have is a restatement of the Davidic covenant about a dynasty and a line culminating in the Messiah. That promise is now handed over to the entirety of the people in Isaiah 55. This language of surety, Watts speaks of as a covenant that is unconditioned and sure, in contrast to the conditioned covenant made to Moses that required obedience. Of course, that's the covenant on Sinai. God is making a commitment he will keep. The result will be nations running to Israel as a sign of honor to them. This hope becomes the basis for an appeal to the nation to turn and receive forgiveness, much like we saw in Isaiah 2, 1 to 5, where the hope of verses 1 to 4 led to the response of faithfulness in verse 5. There are core themes at work here that are being repeated like a refrain in a chorus. In 55, 11 to 13, the point is made that God keeps his promises and they do not return to him empty as he brings a peace that causes creation to rejoice. As McKenzie says, the dynamic word of Yahweh, quote, never returns with its mission unaccomplished. So instead of mission impossible, dun, dun, 
dun, dun, dun, dun, dun, dun, dun. We need to think of mission accomplished. The application in Isaiah 56 is to preserve justice and do righteousness. This inclusion of blessing should lead the blessed people to be a blessing to others. This hope includes foreigners who turn to God, as Isaiah 56.3 argues. They will not be excluded, neither will the eunuch, two groups traditionally seen as outside of God's blessing, uh, are going to be included. These foreigners also will be brought to God's holy mountain to be followers of God who serve him. They will share in the worship of God. The picture is a consistent one in Isaiah of a hope that encompasses all the nations and where Israel has a visible role as a gathering place for the presence peace of God. One question remains. Does Israel have a future, according to other texts, in the New Testament? Has anything changed the picture we get from the prophets? And here we consider two key New Testament texts. The realization of promise and the hope of reconciliation in the New Testament. These two texts that show God bring, brings people together into a new entity, but does, but does not give up on hope for Israel. Romans 11, the regrafting back into promise and blessing. Perhaps no claim introduces more conversation about Israel than the idea that Israel has now become a reference for the church. That approach argues that what was said of Israel now is true of the church, that new entity is the people of God and has a relationship to Jesus the Messiah, who is the ultimate seed and the center of the fulfillment of promise. And there is much truth in this claim. That view is often called supersessionism, but now we're going to tell you, as Paul Harvey said, the rest of the story. Um, that new entity is the people of God and has a relationship to Jesus the Messiah, who is the ultimate seed and the center of fulfillment of promise, and there is much truth in this claim. Jesus is at the center of fulfillment, for sure. He is the ultimate seed in whom the promise is realized, as Galatians 3 makes abundantly clear. As those uh, who Jesus has brought near, Gentiles and any member of the church, become co-heirs of the promise because of the grace shown, shown through Jesus. In saying they have been brought near to promise, they have been made citizens of the promise God made, Ephesians 2, 11 to 22, a text we'll look at shortly. In this way, the promise that always looked to involve the world has brought those responding to Jesus into blessing. However, inclusion of Gentiles does not mean the exclusion of Israel. The problem of significant Jewish rejection was so painful in the first century for Jewish believers that Paul wrote about it. It is clear in Romans 9 to 11 that Paul is discussing ethnic Jews. He opens Romans 9 by noting he wishes himself accursed for the sake of his fellow Jews who have rejected Jesus. That's 9 3. He goes on to discuss the benefits Jews have adoption as sons, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple, and the promises the patriarchs, and the Christ. He is discussing ethnic Israel in this section, not Gentile believers. The problem he raises is about what happened and what will happen. If God doesn't keep his commitments to Israel, then how can we be sure he will keep them for us? After noting that not everyone in Israel is Israel and the existence of a remnant as well, after he notes those two facts, he also deals with the reality that many Jews have a zeal for God that is not according to knowledge. And the rest of the exposition from Romans 9 to 11 has Paul urge a preaching of the gospel that does not reflect ethnic favoritism. That goes back to the claim early on in the book that the gospel is to the Jew first and then to the Greek. In chapter 11, this includes a warning to Gentiles not to be arrogant about their access to the gospel because Gentile inclusion is designed to make Israel jealous. That's 11.11. Paul's making this point means he is still hoping for a response by, a ma by the mass of Jews. In Romans 11.12, he turns his attention to the possibility of restoration for them. He raises the question whether they stumbled so as to fall beyond recovery and answers with an emphatic, by no means. In Greek, this is me genoito, which is a very emphatic way of saying no way. So he explains himself. In verse 15, he hopes for their future acceptance. That acceptance means life from the dead or resurrection. 
Now, if we are sensitive to what Paul is invoking here, he is harking back to the dry bones picture of Ezekiel 37, a nation risen from the dead. He then goes on to discuss branches broken off from an olive tree, along with others now grafted in. In verse 17, Paul notes how some branches were broken off and that you, that is Gentiles, as a wild shoot were grafted in with some of the original branches. They all now share in the richness of the olive root. The exhortation to Gentiles is not to boast over their access, as promise is a root with Jewish connections that supports them. The prospect exists that the whole reversal process could itself be reversed, be reversed if ethnic arrogance surfaces. If natural branches were not spared, unnatural ones could be at risk and cut off if they do not learn from God's grace. In verse 24, things turn back. Paul raises the question that natural branches can be grafted back into their own olive tree. The impression is this is easier than the previous grafting in of unnatural branches. In verse 25, he wants them to understand a mystery and not be conceited. That mystery is a partial hardening has taken place to Israel until the full number of Gentiles has come in. Two points cannot be missed here. One, Israel has to be ethnic Israel here because of the contextual contrast to the Gentiles and the image of being reconnected for this non-Gentile group. And two, the crucial term until tells us things are as they are now, but will once again change. And that change anticipates the grafting in of natural branches Paul has been discussing leading into this point. Partial and permanent hardening is not, rather permanent hardening is not the fate of Israel. A reversal of that hardening is coming. This is the content of the mystery Paul is revealing here. In this way, Israel, the Israel he's been talking about consistently in these three chapters, will be saved. The pictures of a Messiah associated with Zion who will regather his people, and there will be no ungodliness left in Jacob, verse 26. The language here recapitulates the picture of texts like those we saw from the Hebrew Scriptures, and the language comes from such texts, including Isaiah 59, 20 and 21, Isaiah 27, 9, and Jeremiah 31, 33 and 34. All the Isaiah texts cited do is develop the hope as expressed in texts like Isaiah 2, 19, and 55, and 56. The, there are other texts of Jewish eschatological hope. God will perform his covenant with them, and Paul believes God will keep his word and his promise. God will forgive Israel's sins. That's in eleven twenty six and 27. The everlasting covenant of peace made with Israel will be realized for her, just as it has been with the Gentiles. The picture is of reconciliation, pure and simple a reconciliation that leaves no room for ethnic arrogance on either side. Why does God do it? God acts in this way because of the fathers, the patriarchs, and because the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. That's 11, 28, and 29. In other words, put very simply, in a way that even anyone with a basic degree in math can understand, God keeps his promises. Faithfulness to his character and commitments means there is every reason to hope for the restoration of Israel because only her presence in significant numbers can paint the picture of reconciliation that is a core result of the gospel with its hope for peace, not just with God, but with others. The goal is to show mercy to all, 1130 to 32. The consideration of the entire sequence of hope leads Paul to praise God for the depths and riches of his wisdom and knowledge, verses 33 to 36. The reversal that comes with grace at an ethnic level is itself pointing to a repeat in the opposite direction so that all nations can share in God's blessing without favoritism. This emphasis exists because all have the same need for God. At a corporate level, Paul repeats a theme he has raised as early as Romans 3. All have the same need for a Savior. All get access to God on the same basis. All get access to all the same blessings. The one people is made up of the reconciled many in Christ. No wonder the Hebrew Scripture saw a day when all would come to Jerusalem and worship God together. 
It will be their capital one day, and they will share one king. My, my observation about the millennium is, is that no one will debate who the Pope is when Jesus comes back. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 11 to 22. Jew and Gentile together and reconciled. Paul also develops this reconciliation in Ephesians 2. Here he goes the other way. He starts with how Gentiles were far off and detached from promise. They were the uncircumcision, without Messiah, alienated from the citizenship of Israel, strangers to the covenant of covenants of promise, without hope and without God. Now the blood of Christ has brought them near, which here clearly means has brought them in. See verse 13. Christ has become peace for Jews and Gentiles in which the hostility has been destroyed and commandments nullified as God has made of the two entities one new man making peace. The one new man image is not an internal image for an individual. It's a corporate image about how God brings Jew and Gentile together into one new human person. It's the equivalent of being in Christ in contrast to the past in being in Adam. It takes two to make peace. God through Christ has become the middleman in that transaction between Jews and Gentiles as all get access to the Spirit through Christ. That's verses 14 to 18. The result is that Gentiles are no longer foreigners and non-citizens, but fellow citizens with the saints as members of the house of God, a sacred people compared to a cleansed temple. That's 2, 19 to 22. We do the church much damage if we understate what is in view here. The reconciliation is one of the primary means by which we see the power of the gospel and testify to God's amazing work. Imagine what it would be like if Jews and Gentiles were actually seen to be reconciled to one another. Imagine the statement that automatically makes to the world. You would need to say absolutely nothing other than that's a miracle of God. That work is not just with us as individuals, but between peoples. The gospel makes claims and shows itself in a thorough reclamation of the creation and its structures. One of the ways that is shown is by how enmity between people should be removed when Christ resides among the lives of peoples. The implication of Israel as a nation for all, including Arabs, in the theme of reconciliation. So what are the benefits? What's the application? Well, first, let's talk about the Middle East. The idea that Israel has a future as a nation and a right to the land has major implications for the Middle East. The attempt by some to eliminate her presence as a nation there is illegitimate on various grounds. Theologically, the nation has had a right to the land because it is part of God's promise to Israel. However, for many, it is, by, is hers also by legal right something a careful retracing of the complex history of the region from the Balfour Declaration on can show. The failure of many of her enemies to recognize her right to exist is part of what has created the tension in the Middle East. Such recognition should be a given in the effort to make political progress in the region. The emphasis on reconciliation should also make one careful not to turn this right into a defense of a kind of nationalism at the expense of God's care and concern for others. This has significance because it means Israel does not have a carte blanche to do whatever she desires in the region. She is responsible for justice concerns because of the prophet's call for justice from those who claim to have ties to Israel's God as well as out of respect for all being made in God's image. The Middle East is a tangled mess, as anyone knows. And part of the pressure on justice concerns comes from the deep hatred that has motivated much violence from some opposed to Israel's presence in the region. Many of her actions are part of an attempt to pursue self-defense in the face of those who would seek to harm or eliminate the nation. The idea that Israel has a right to exist and to be treated with the rights and protections of any nation means these attempts should be seen not as conflicts of liberation, but as violations of international law. The suppression of such a recognition for Israel in the Middle East does nothing to advance the cause of peace there. Only a recognition and the protection that goes with it allows for an environment that then can, be, can more easily pursue peace. All of this is a direct implication of the recognition of Israel's right to exist as a people 
and an understanding that behind all the legal and political uh, wrangling stand theological concerns. Any theological perspective that excludes Israel as a part of the divine promise program only clouds things in the Middle East and sets the background for a defense of the kind of violence we see from both sides. Yet the emphasis on reconciliation means that the presence of Israel should not be seen as a threat to Arabs. The divine program foresees a nation that eventually turns back to God and becomes part of a larger reconciliation program from him. It is not an affirmation of nationalism to affirm a role for Israel. On Christ's return, she is to be the source of global blessing that all will welcome. It is clear this is a deep theological claim. Only seeing this direction for the program of God in Christ allows one to see this potential direct trajectory for the Middle East. What does all this mean for the church? For the church, the church is designed to be a place that previews where things are headed. It is to show a commitment to faithfulness to God's word, a love for God and for others, and to be a community that gives evidence of the reconciliation to come. We have not always done this well, in part because of the already not yet character of salvation. We're not yet perfect, although I didn't need, you didn't need me to tell you that. Where growth is what takes place in the midst of moving towards the consummation as opposed to a grand leap to perfection. The church should be characterized, nonetheless, by an even-handedness and a sense of justice that not only pursues righteousness, but is appropriately self-critical as it responds to God's commitment to grow us as individuals and as the body of Christ. That means there will be success and failure, but the aims of the church should be able to reflect the product of the gospel in terms of truth and in terms of love relationally. If the goal of salvation is the regaining of a flourishing before God and the presence of genuine shalom between peoples, then the church should be an example of how that works and should argue for moves towards such rec rec reconciliation between people as they urge them to respond to what God has designed for the peoples of the world. To paraphrase Galatians 6.10, those in the church are to do good to all people, especially those of the faith. That also means being concerned about justice towards all, including those of the faith. God is a God of all nations, and the church needs to be careful to reflect that commitment alongside its discussion of God's revealed plan. Last, what about divine promise and the character of God? What does all this mean for that? In many ways, this point stands at the core of the thesis for this essay. Was at stake in the future for Israel and the reconciliation of the nations in Christ is not only related to the status of a particular people and nation, but a reading about the character of God and his revelation as he acts on behalf of the world. Many of the texts we cited, especially in the Old Testament, discuss the certainty of God's word. The completion of this promise reveals God's character to be faithful and shows he will keep his word to those to whom he originally made it. The veracity of God and the clarity of his communication are both in play with this theme. In many ways, he stakes his reputation upon completing this promise. The prophets compare the promise's certainty to remarks about the surety of the creation. The connection serves to underscore the prophet's view, and the apostrophe is after the S, about the promise's realization. It will take place and all nations will share in the unity and joy it brings to humanity. This hope is not about nationalism, nor is it only about reconciliation. It is about God's grace and character as rooted in his promises. It is about his word and it is about who he is. God's faithfulness to Israel is actually also a picture of his faithfulness to all his children. What is true for Israel is true for all who belong to God. In Israel's future as a nation, we see our own future as well. And we see a reconciliation that cancels out all our nationalisms and all our tribalisms. Only such an exit can bring real hope to the Middle East. The realized culminated work of Messiah, including a hope for national Israel, and the long-revealed promises of God 
unites us as one people. It also shows a God who keeps his word, is worthy of honor as the designer of that amazing global grace. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Um, we have a little time, and uh, it wasn't really in the program, but I thought it might be worthwhile to take a couple of questions. So perhaps you have a question for Dr. Bach on his presentation that uh, you would like him to answer. Uh, again, a question. Uh, we're not asking for a three-minute sermon, but just a question. So yes, please stand up and, and speak out loud. It's going to be in a book. The book will probably be out next year? Yeah, I think early next year. Yeah, sometime next year. We're, we're, we'll compile it all, and then we're going to be uh, putting together a book of these presentations, the one that's at Southwestern, and add a few others that uh, won't actually be presented. So yeah, there'll, there'll be a book that will have all of these, and what Daryl shared really was just an abbreviated version of the full essay. That's right. Someone else? Quick question. So, um, what were the particular scripture references that he covered? I didn't, uh, just a couple of the highlights. There are Isaiah 2, 1 to 4. Okay. Isaiah 19, 21 to 23. Okay. The discussion in Isaiah 55 and 56. I didn't even mention uh, the, co the new covenant in Jeremiah or the rising of the dry bones in Ezekiel 37. Then uh, Romans, uh, Romans 9 to 11, and Ephesians 2, 11 to 22. Those were the specific texts that we mentioned. Good. Someone else? Yes. Stand up and please, nice and loud. He's basically urging them, as he is in the entirety of the section, for Gentiles to not become so arrogant about the blessings that they now possess in Christ that they don't care about their about actually witnessing to Jewish people and for reflecting what the gospel is all about, which is that the gospel is for everybody. So the warning is, if it, look, if natural branches can get cut off and separated, you can get cut off and separated too. If Gentiles become arrogant about their blessings, God can very easily go back and recover Jewish people and Gentiles can be tossed off the side. And of course, Paul doesn't want this. He wants Gentiles to share about Christ with everybody, including, in fact, firstly, with Jews. That's what Romans 1.16 says. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first as well as to the Greek. So, so this is an exhortation against tribalism, ethnic favoritism, and, and anything that, that smacks of that. that. This actually has huge implications, not just for Jew-Gentile relationships, but for all the relationships that emanate out of the church, for all kinds of groups. It's a lesson the church desperately needs to grasp hold of. Good. Yes, could you stand up nice and loud? Yeah, I, I think that the, pro the problem that we have is that when we think about the people of God, the people of God is made up today. The people of God is made up of, of people who are both members of the church and who have come out of Israel. Messianic Jews come out of Israel. Now, they're part of what today is called the church, but there also is a stream of connection that Messianic Jews have both to the past as a part of Israel and to the future in terms of Israel restored. So even though this group is in the church, in the body of Christ, they're in Christ, they're obviously Christians, they also have this ethnic connection that doesn't go away and it maintains itself. God has made commitments to Israel as a people and as a nation. 
He did so in, uh, in Genesis 12, and those commitments will renew in a significant way for a much larger group than the remnant when, as Christ is coming back. So, so that's, that's the distinction that you're dealing with. Now, some people want to take the Israel bucket, turn it into believers, and drop it all in the church, and then you lose Israel, on, not so much on the back end. Yes, Israel was promised back there, but you lose it in the future. That's called what, what's often been called supersessionism. If you talk to someone who believes this, they say, I'm teaching fulfillment theology, to which I like to say, well, if you're going to talk about fulfillment theology, let's talk about what the fulfiller, Christ, has to say about Israel. The moment you do that, you've got a future for Israel. Yes, sir. Please. Nice and loud. Okay. Uh, thank you for your uh, comment. At the end, under application for the church needing to be even-handed uh, in regards to the different tribes. So, uh, my question is about this this lack of even-handedness. I, I work with a Jewish political lobby, and I had the privilege to tour uh, in Israel and and in the uh, West Bank. And inadvertently, we ran into Arab. Christians, who were frankly all appalled that the uh, American church, the Western church, was not even-handed. Uh, can you agree that we're not even-handed, and what do you attribute that to, and what do we do about it? Thank you. Well, I think there's just a lot of work that needs to be done. Whenever I go to Israel, I end up on being on both sides of the wall. I have conversations with Messianic believers, I have conversations with Gentile believers who are on one side of the wall, and I have conversations with Arab and Palestinian believers on the other side of the wall. The interesting thing that you hear is you hear the same stories, basically, in terms of justice, only the white hats and the black hats change, okay? And everybody's got a wonderful memory, okay? They remember that stuff. So... Part of what needs to happen, I think, is to get into, this is what I mean by the self-critical part, to actually, each side needs to take a hard look at itself, okay? What normally happens when people are estranged is you point the finger at the other person and say, what you're doing to me is wrong, okay? But the only way you get towards reconciliation is when you look at yourself and you're willing to say, what I have done is wrong. I contribute to this. So when I'm talking about even-handedness, that's what I'm talking about. Thanks. One more question. <laughs> well, I have a dumb question. No dumb questions allowed. <laughs> 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 now, what's your question? But nice and loud, please. <laughs> We've got the, the Gentiles. Who is included in that group? Everybody who's not Jewish. Yeah. It's a big global pot. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's not a dumb question. It's a big question. Muslims okay. And it's everybody. everybody. Yeah. It's everybody who's not Jewish. Okay. Okay. How about a hand for Dr. Bach? <laughs> <laughs>